Good afternoon. I am Dr. John Nordling, the Department of Exegetical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary, and I'm very glad to be with you to present to you Mark 1, 20, 21 to 28, which is Epiphany 4b. Now, one thing I'd like to do just very quickly is have a brief show and tell, and tell you where I get all my ideas from. They're not my ideas, but um, I want to kind of show you something that I try to teach the students around here at the seminary, some, you know, more or less successfully. Um, I find this huge tome, uh, Concordance to the Greek Testament, by Moulton and Gieden to be very, very valuable because it, what it does is it is a concordance of all of the Greek words that occur within a New Testament document. And what you can do is see where it occurs within the document itself and how it occurs. So it gives the brief phrase. So, so you can see if the, the word is, you know, word for word uh, repeated. And um, it also uh, accounts for formulas that occur. And you can also quickly compare it then with, since we're working with synoptics, what happens in Matthew as well as in Luke. So this is a very valuable thing, my most important um, tool, and I don't believe in all that modern claptrap gizmory that they have now. This, this is very good. It was published in 1897, and it's never been improved upon as far as I'm concerned. Um, another book uh, is uh, BDAG which stands for Bauer, Danker, Arndt, Gingrich, published in 2000. Many of you, if you're a seminary graduates of, of CTS, you, you have this in your library. I encourage my students to use this for rare and uh, uncommon words. Um, so not always, but just if you suspect it's a, a rarely occurring word and how it's used, it will take you, you know, elsewhere within the New Testament corpus and far beyond that. And as a classicist, I find that very, very interesting. Uh, then, since we're working on the synops synop synoptics, um, this synopsis quator evangeliorum, which puts the Greek text into columns, and today our text is going to be divided between Mark 1 and Luke 4, so you can look, just do a side-by-side -side comparison, what is exactly the same and what's different. And that can be very valuable when you're doing up-close work, as we often are. Usually I don't have the students use this because it's just too much. If I can get them to use the first two books, that's plenty. Uh, some of them don't do that very well. But this is something that pastors should be using just to get a feel for the theology of, a, of, of one of the evangelists. And then finally, um, a commentary. And here is Veltz's brand new commentary uh, on Mark 11826, published by CPH just recently. Um, I think I, I read this last just to fill in the blanks for things that I might have overlooked and to keep myself from being completely idiosyncratic. But um, if you know your Greek well and can work with it, um, you can be your own uh, uh, theologian. And that's what we want to produce at our seminary, our really you know, competent pastors who have a good command for the Greek and are constantly using that. And using the tools, as I call it, and then you come out with more ideas that can, than you can use. And you've seen by the length of these presentations that I have been rather long-winded, for which I apologize. So let's get right to the text, uh, which is Mark 1, 21 to 28. And so once again, um, Bill, I don't see my, uh, oh, is it over here? Oh, this isn't it. Um, sorry about that. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I've, got, uh, I've got the text, and I'd like to uh, just say very briefly um, Ep Ep Epiphany 4 Series B, which is Jesus' first teaching on, on the Sabbath. He's going to be teaching on the Sabbath later in the Gospel. 
and uh, also in the synagogue, and the bemused amazement um, of his unique teaching is, is called for, and I think we can say much more than that. It's Jesus' first confrontation with an unclean spirit, the first of many such confrontations, and his exorcism, which is his complete victory over the realm of the demonic, uh, and then that uh, uh, occasions the elicitation of the group in the synagogue at Capernaum. So once again, um, just a, an overview of the text itself. You'll see that I've divided it. Uh, well, it's, it was, this is how it is in the, in the Nestle, all on 27th edition. Uh, the first two verses being um, uh, 21 through 22, which provides kind of a frame. And then the actual miracle, the exorcism itself, which is uh, 23 through 28. Um, and as I said uh, earlier, um, the uh, first two verses, the teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum, has a parallel in Luke 4, uh, 31 to 32, which has virtually the same setting and crowd reaction. And then for the second half, uh, verses 23 through 28, again, the parallel is Luke 4, 33 to 37. So just like Mark, um, it has the same frame and then the same miracle, and it's a continuation of the story. Matthew has no part in this story, um, nor John, of course, as we would expect. So one of the questions that naturally comes to mind is, did Mark... Uh, influence Luke, or did Luke influence Mark? And the answer is, I cannot say. <laughs> um, but they, the two are often word for word the same, and I can't weigh in because um, I mean, it would be interesting to hear what Peter Scare would say to that question. So, let's work uh, systematically through the text. And... Uh, once again, um, uh, you have, like uh, last uh, week, um, the verb-subject pattern. You have the first one of those in verse 25, um, which is uh, epitemason auto ha Jesus. So you have the verb here and the subject here. Okay, you have three of these. Uh, the second one is in verse 27. Um, Kai ethambe theson hapantes. Okay, so you have your verb first, ethambe theson and hapantes, uh, so that they began to argue against one another, saying, and then so forth. And finally, you have, um, in verse 28, you have, ex eilphon he akoe autu. So, there, hap there, there went forth his, or, or news of him, immediately, everywhere. Okay, so again, you have the verb first, and then you have the subject. And, you know, I was reflecting on this last time, so what? Well, the so what is that it's very Hebraic. Um, Hebrew in the Semitic caste, uh, this, is, this is what happens in Hebrew regularly. So you have the same flavor uh, in, in this text as well as you do elsewhere in Mark. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, and I have... Uh, highlighted these in red. Uh, you have chi is the basic conjugation, uh, conjunction, I mean. You have it twice in verse 21, chi, chi. In verse 22, chi exaplesanto. In verse 23, chi euthus, he was in the synagogue. Um, then you have in uh, verse 25, Kai epitimesen auto ha Jesus 
26, Kai Sparak San Auton, Kai in verse 30, uh, 27, um, and in verse 28. So there are, by my counting, um, eight of these total. Uh, the, verse 21 has two of them, so that's virtually one Kai per verse. There are uh, eight verses. Uh, but not every chi that occurs uh, is this type of uh, chi as the basic conjunction. For example, in verse 27, you have a chi in the initial position, uh, which I have not only read, it, but I've also bolded it, because that's a different type of chi. Um, and as you work with it, uh, indeed, he is rebuking the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So this is the, this is the, uh, the observer's reaction to Jesus' miracle. So that would be an exclamation mark. That's a very powerful affirmation of what Jesus has done. So just, uh, you know, to, this is why, we, why I teach Greek and why I hope you learn it for little fine points like this that you can't, certainly can't get in the English, okay? So all of these chi's, chi, 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 what that does is it makes short, choppy uh, sentences and they are agitated and it contributes to the Markan style. Uh, the third thing that I didn't talk about that much last time but I'd like to today and that's to say something very quickly about euthus, this, uh, this adverb famous in Mark. You have one in uh, 21, another in 23, euthus, which I've highlighted in green, and where's the last one in the, in the last verse? Um, uh, and news of him went forth immediately everywhere, Pontaco, to into the whole surrounding area of Galilee. That's how the passage ends. Now, Euthus, as I think I said last time, um, <clears throat> it occurs 11 times total in just the first chapter of, of Matthew alone. So we have three of those 11 in today's verse. And I have this wonderful quote that I want to share with you from uh, Richard Burris. And uh, this is from a piece uh, that he wrote, The Bounding Lion. We have our Greek students read this in Gospels 2. What he does is he compares uh, uh, the Markan style and the symbol, the ancient symbol of Mark, as you may know, was the lion to Aslan. Okay, in uh, the Lion, the Witch, of, in the wardrobe uh, of C.S. Lewis. Now just listen to this. Uh, the sheer pace of it all is unrelenting. So, you know, the Lion in, in, uh, in, in the C.S. Lewis books, uh, he's always, uh, he dashes from place to place as he is needed in great leaps and bounds. He rushes on and on, never missing his footing, never hesitating, okay? So too in Mark's first chapter, all right, and really throughout the whole gospel. The sheer pace of it all is unrelenting. This material occupies several chapters in Matthew and Luke, but here Jesus rushes around just like a bounding lion. It all happens and immediately at once or straight away, which are all translations of Kai Euthus, which occurs 11 times in chapter 1 alone and is linked with make his path straight in 1-3, right? No wonder he had to get up very early to pray in verse 35. This pace continues with Euthus occurring over 40 times in Mark, about as often as the rest of the New Testament put together. So it's very remarkable. And it's, uh, if you can work with the Greek, um, you get a sense of the of the speed of this and the unerring um, accuracy, if you will, of Jesus the Messiah. All right, let's then talk about the, um, some individual things. And uh, I want to start with how it begins, 
tai is por yuan tai is kaparnaum. Um, uh, you have a present tense there. That's what you'd call a historic present, right? And I want to call attention to you this stylistic thing. You have a compound verb, and they entered into. Look at is por yuan tai is kafarnaum. That happens again and again in Greek. It just happens everywhere, and you've got to have a feel for this. Um, the, uh, the preposition in the compound is repeated in the accompanying uh, prepositional phrase, okay? So, um, uh, and it's plural, and it doesn't say who the subjects are, but we know from last week who the subjects are. Uh, it's Simon, Andrew, James, John, remember those were the sons of Zebedee, and of course Jesus. Those are the subjects which supply um, uh, continuity to, to last week's gospel. And they enter Capernaum, okay? Capernaum, um, which is on the northern uh, shore of the Sea of Galilee. Um, when I went to Israel back in 2011 in November, um, <clears throat> that was my favorite place. And I'll tell you why. Because you can see the synagogue, okay, the very synagogue that is featured here in today's text. And then also for next Sunday, which is going to be um, uh, Epiphany 5, you have the house of the mother-in-law of, of Peter and how Jesus um, heals her from her fever. Okay, that's going to be featured next week by somebody else, not me. But you have, therefore, um, the church. And what the Catholics have done is erect this humongous church over the very, what's believed to be, the very house where this miracle happened and all of that. So um, uh, it really helps uh, to look at this on a map or better yet, to go to Israel and see this uh, as a pilgrim. Um, it, it was very, very moving to me. And if you can't do that yet, I had to wait many years after all before I got to go. Check it out in a Bible dictionary. Read up on it. Because Capernaum is the home base for Jesus and his disciples. And we know why, because that's where Peter was and Peter's mother-in-law. Okay, the next thing. Moving right along, um, <clears throat> uh, look at this phrase here, uh, kai euthus tois sabason, all right? And immediately on the Sabbath, now here is a good place to point out the dative of time when, and it's in the plural. Why is it in the plural? Um, I'm not quite sure to tell you the truth. But it may well be a fixed liturgical expression. You have the same expression in 2.23 and 24. Chapter 3, verse 2 and 4. Um, you have the same uh, phrase used in Josephus several times. I got that information from BDAG, which I just showed you. Um, the point is that some of Jesus' most um, significant and most amazing teaching happens on the Sabbath. Um, it establishes the idea that you're going to see in Mark's Gospel that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, that he fulfills that Old Testament scruple. Now that he's here, and he is here, everything changes in our understanding of what the Sabbath is. And that happens, that would include what's depicted here today, which is a healing and an exorcism in the synagogue and the lordship of Jesus over the, 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 the demonic. And it happens in a synagogue, a place of teaching, and I think it doesn't require too much um, imagination to connect that to church, where the Christians of today go to hear the word uh, preached by the apostolically commissioned minister of the gospel, and there is a confrontation by a very disruptive and unruly demon-possessed person, right, that you have going on here, 
and, but Jesus throws that demon out. And that happens in the synagogue, uh, which is very remarkable, and it happens in a way in church. As the word of God preached by the pastor who's called and ordained to be there, uh, preaches it, and Jesus, through his office and ministry, throws out uh, the demons. Um, and you have that victory. Um, so, <clears throat> I, I need to make that point. All right. Um, then we have, um, and then uh, another phrase just to uh, touch upon is, um, and I've underlined it already, astain synagogain into the uh, synagogue. And in verse 23, um, there was immediately in the synagogue, in their synagogue. And it's also got the definite article. See, what that does is it's the well-known synagogue. I mean, that's the, that's the effect of that. And their synagogue, namely the inhabitants of Capernaum, um, who are bemused. They don't know what to do about Jesus and his teaching. They, they register how amazing and unique it is. Um, but that's the setting, and I already told you I've been there. I've been in the very place where this amazing miracle happened, and it leaves an impression on the pilgrim. Go there as soon as you can. Um, look at the relationship of the participle clauses. So you have ace el phone, ace tain synago gain. Once again, see the compound verb, ace el phone, ace into the synagogue. So that's an aorist participle. So, and when he had entered into the synagogue, then you have an imperfect edidaskin, he began to teach. Okay? Um, uh, inceptive, uh, imperfect perhaps. Um, there's always some, uh, some wiggle room when you're dealing with the imperfect. It can mean different things. <clears throat> so here, um, uh, we can't review everything, but um, it occurs, I forgot to count, oh, 17 times, 17 times in the gospel. We can't uh, talk everything, but it's uh, programmatic. I mean, you got the first verb, the first occurrence of Jesus' teaching here. Here, Jesus teaches with authority and great impact and victory over Satan. Um, in 4.1 and 4.2, Jesus is going to teach in parables. In 9.31, you have Jesus' private teaching of his own disciples, who are more than just four at that point. In 10.1, you have Jesus' habit of teaching. That's how it's put. Jesus is in the habit of teaching. And then in 12.35, Jesus' teaching in the temple during Holy Week right, the, the, the week in which he's going to be betrayed, and he spends some time in the temple teaching. So just to give you a flavor, and you can mention in your sermon that uh, this is what Jesus is going to be doing um, in the gospel and in the series as you go through it with your people. Uh, uh, the pastor isn't doing this so much as Jesus Christ himself is through the pastor's ministry. All right, enough on that. Um, the next thing is um, this wonderful phrase in uh, verse 22, kai exeplesanto epite didake autu. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, ekpleso, a very interesting word. Um, it literally means to be, pleso means to strike, to strike, ek. Out. So, to be thunderstruck, that's what it means, okay? They are, it, it's translated amazed in English, but that is nothing but an abstraction. The Greek is much more concrete, okay? They are, they are just struck out of what opinion they had before and brought to this point of view um, a standard way of being flummoxed in Mark's Gospel. It occurs here in 122, again in 6, 2, 
10, 26, 11, 28. Now the closest parallel is in 11, 11, 18, I mean, not 28, 11, 18, where you have the Pharisees and scribes try to destroy Jesus. This again is during that last Holy Week. For all the crowd was amazed at his teaching. That's why they were trying so hard to get rid of him. And you have the same thing here uh, in our first <clears throat> encounter with it. And while we're at it, we should then look at verse 27 here, because you have kai ephambethason, hapontes hosta. Okay? So, thambao or thambaomai, you'll find it listed both ways, and that is also translated amaze. Now, I don't know what the difference is. I mean, it doesn't, the second uh, uh, it doesn't have the same idea of being, you know, beaten out of something. Fambao just means to be amazed, and fambas, the cognate noun, uh, is amazement, right? Um, so they were all amazed, and this is a Markan word that occurs only in Mark. Um, it's in 127, that's this passage, in 1024 and 1032. In 1024, the disciples were amazed at Jesus' words. The word was how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. So that had an amazing effect upon the, a dismaying effect upon the disciples. And then in 1032, the disciples again are amazed at what's going to happen to Jesus in Jerusalem. That's the third passion prediction. Okay? So those are the only places it doesn't occur in any of the other Gospels, but only in Mark. So um, here uh, in, in, in this, in, in both um, places, the amazement at, is at Jesus' teaching. Okay? They were amazed at his teaching teaching, epi te didache autu, in verse uh, 22, because he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. <coughs> Belts, in his treatment, has a very good uh, point making that um, in uh, first century rabbinical Judaism, the attempt of the rabbis is always to argue on the basis of what some other rabbi had said. But Jesus' teaching is unique. Um, Jesus teaches on the basis of the Old Testament and in consonant with that, and then his own teaching, the fact that, that he is, um, you know, the kingdom uh, has come and, and is now here like we saw in last, last Sunday. So... Um, uh, he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Now that leads then to um, exousia, which occurs twice in today's text. In 122, where is it? I put it in blue, a very important word, and then it's also down in verse 27, the um, authority. <coughs> um, it's also in Mark 2.10, 3.15, 6.7, 29, and 33. Now, um, I can't go through each of these, but for example, in 2.10, the Son of Man has exousia to forgive sins on earth. That's what it says there, okay? And then also, um, Jesus sends the twelve to preach and, quote, to have exousia, to throw out the demons, which is very much continuing the work begun in today's text. That's in 315. Um, and that calls to mind, of course, Matthew. And I happen to believe in Matthean priority. Many of us do here at Fort Wayne. And that text in Matthew 28, 18, all authority, pasa exousia, has been given to me, moi edathe, in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, and you have the, the great commission. <clears throat> so, um, if there's any connection to Matthew's gospel, and I believe there is, 
This is a further outworking of the authority that has been granted to the Son by the Father at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And Mark then uh, develops this in his way and in your ministry as you teach it, um, as you're going to be preaching this text. Now we have to get um, to, and I'm already going on, I'm sorry I'm so long-winded, but there's so much in the text, and I haven't hardly even used belts. You notice that? I mean, it's very amazing. Let's get to the actual miracle itself, which is in uh, 23 through 28. And what it is, is an exorcism, and it anticipates all of the exorcisms that are going to be going on in Mark. Mark is uh, distinctive for that. Now, you, of course, you have it in Matthew and Luke, too. Um, but Mark, and, you know, I didn't say this last time, and Veltz never talks about it in his commentary, but what was Mark's um, audience? See, that's a, that's a big question. I happen to think, my own private opinion is, that it's intended for a Roman audience. Okay, it reflects John Mark, who is um, a, a, a disciple, um, an associate of Paul as well as Peter. He connects both of those very important apostleships. And he would have been a bilingual Jew. Um, the house of John Mark is mentioned in Acts. And he connects both the Petrine apostleship and the Pauline apostleship. He would have known Latin and probably Greek. And he could have well been uh, St. Peter's guide when he comes to Rome and he's going to be martyred on the cross upside down. That's the old tradition. So a lot of this stuff could reflect a Roman audience, and all of this stuff about demons and exorcisms, man, if you know anything about ancient Rome, that's what went on in that city. In fact, in Ephesus too, and in all the cities of the Roman Empire where, where great uh, sinners were gathered, just like in America, we have the same problems in our cities, as well as any American knows, okay? So it's an exorcism. It anticipates the exorcism um, of 134, um, and I'd like to read that to you very quickly, um, where, uh, and this is going to be for next Sunday, and he, and he Jesus healed many who were doing badly with uh, diverse diseases, and he threw out many daimonia, many demons, and he did not allow the demons to be speaking, lawlane, present, ongoing, infinitive, because they knew him. Okay, that's what you have in 134. So there's a direct connection there. Um, it also anticipates the cleansing of the leper in 140 to 45 which is how the first chapter of Mark ends. Jesus versus Beelzebul in uh, chapter 3, verse 20 and following. The healing of the Gerasene demoniac, chapter 5, verses 1 and following. The healing of the boy with the unclean spirit, that's 9, 14 and following, etc. I mean, I probably overlooked some, but this is a dominant theme um, <clears throat> the exorcisms, Jesus throwing out demons and his victory over them is a dominant theme in Mark's gospel. So, this miracle is programmatic and it's anticipatory. It presage, presages Jesus' authority and healing in the gospel. And what is going to happen here is a result of a faithful pastor's teaching and ministry also, I would submit. These things happen at church in the synagogue, in and through the public ministry, as it were. Okay, so that's what Jesus is doing. Um, I just wanted also to, uh, I'm going more quickly through this second half, but just to show you um, one of the things that's very amazing in this text is how disruptive this man was in the synagogue. Um, he is in Noimati, Akar, uh, akatharto, in an uh, unclean spirit, kai anekraksen, he cried out, saying, 
And then, what to us and to you, O Jesus of Nazareth, did you come to destroy us? So, um, you know, uh, there's more than just one demon here. Um, sometimes it's portrayed in the plural, but um, it, it's an unwashed, an unclean uh, 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 spirit. And I like how Belts um, connects this to Jesus' baptism. Uh, as you know, in Jesus' baptism with John the baptizer, it says that the spirit entered ace auton, not ep auton, like the other gospels, but into him. So what you have in Jesus is the Holy Spirit who is then um, encountering this unclean demonic spirit and there's no contest, okay, um, what, what's going on. But this guy is very disruptive. This is, you know, liturgical worship like we have in our churches. And this guy is find, finding out that Jesus is there and he pr produces a, an outburst that obviously interrupts um, the, the service. And uh, instead of saying, shh, 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 let's go on, you know, Jesus uh, uses this to expel the demon and therefore, um, like I said before, um, brings about the true purpose of the Sabbath and what happens on the Sabbath and that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. Um, so did you come to destroy us? Uh, verse 24, I know you who you are. Okay. Um, th this is called an indirect question. The Holy One of God. Okay. That ha hagias tu theu um, uh, um, a phrase that, um, uh, and, then, um, uh, uh, and then you have in verse 25, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, okay, and then what he says is, fim otheti kai ex eiltha ex auton, be muzzled and come forth from him. Very dramatic. You got the second person, aorist. Uh, indicative pass, uh, not indicative, but imperative passive. Um, uh, be muzzled, be gagged, and come out of him. Okay, and then in in uh, verse 26, you have the actual uh, exorcism itself. It's very difficult Greek, but sparaxan auton ta noima ta akartharton kai phone son phone megale. And then ex aelthon ex out too. He came out of him. So what Jesus tells him to do, the devil indeed does. He doesn't have a choice. Jesus is uh, the climactic uh, master over the devil. Now just look at this Greek. You got these participles: sparaxon auton, ton noima ta akatharton. There it is again, impure spirit, phoneson. So these are not uh, third person plurals. But these are aorist, uh, aorist participle forms. Um, they're third declension. So sparoxon is going to decline sparoxon, sparoxon ta, sparoxon ti, sparoxon, right? That's what, that's what is throwing you off. So the, the unclean spirit, having convulsed him and having shouted, phone son, phone megale with a loud voice, came out. Of him, so the emphasis is on the demons coming out. Um, something else that struck me, and that's why I bolded it. You have ex aelthon, uh, ex autu in verse 26, and then look at uh, 20, verse 28. Okay, there you have um, news of him came out immediately everywhere. So. The, the demon comes out of the demon-possessed man, and then news of Jesus goes out, okay? Why? I don't know, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's rather striking. You can see that in the Greek. I don't know what to make of that. Um, okay, uh, and then kind of one last thing, uh, just to um, unclutter my board once again, and that is um, um, in verse 27, and they uh, were amazed, all of them. And then you have hosta, uh, sudzetain pros autos. 
Uh, this, of course, is called a result clause potential. Okay, it's a potential result clause. You have the clause marker hosta, then you have an infinitive, all right, and it's a present infinitive, so that they um, were discussing. That's how a lot of people translate this sudze teo, and indeed, I did some work on that <coughs> in BDAG one. They give as the example, as the translation, to carry on a discussion to discuss, and they compare it to Luke 24, 15, where the, uh, uh, the disciples in Luke 24 are having a, a discussion. But what if, and I like this a lot, what if instead of meaning a discussion, they are having an argument, all right, to contend with persistence for a point of view, dispute, debate, argue. That's the second meaning of sudze teo given in BDAG. And how would that affect our interpretation of this passage? Well, it could mean, and this is just my um, do with it what you wish, it could mean that there was a positive buzz for Jesus from the get-go, from the moment of the miracle itself, radiating out from the synagogue and into the surrounding community. That's what the perichoron of Galilee means. Um, and if that's the case, this would be a type of confession for who Jesus is and what he means. And this in the Gospel of Mark, where with the Mark and secret and so forth and ambiguity, you're not really supposed to be seeing this. In Matthew, yes, right? In Matthew 28. But does it happen that way in Mark? Well, it would if you, if you give me a little bit of a room here. Um, it would be a confession, and it anticipates the sending of the Gospels and the Gentile mission. Um, the upshot of their proclamation is this. Jesus' teaching is kine. It is a didache kaine, one according to authority. Um, it's powerful. It's never been heard of before, and um, it is still revealing Jesus to the Gentiles even now to be climaxed in the transfiguration, right? We're, we're still in the season of Epiphany, toward which Epiphany tends. So there's plenty of material there for you and God's blessings to you as you deliver it to your people. Thank you.